Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. The Geneva 2 talks may have gone off down the wrong track. For a start, they're not in Geneva, but an hour away in Montreux. And one of the most important players in the Syrian drama, Iran, has been disinvited because a petrol station masquerading as a country vetoed their attendance. More on that petrol station in a moment. The U.S. Secretary of State opened the Geneva Two Talks by demanding Bashar the end of the presidency of Bashar al-Assad, even though that wasn't even on the agenda. And so the conference opened to the backdrop of a hugely expensive propaganda offensive against the Syrian regime in news media around the world, few of whom mentioned that this material was bought and paid for by Qatar, the aforementioned petrol station. The Syrian foreign minister's opening gambit was Churchill-esque, and I mean that in a good way. Because he's not very handsome and wasn't speaking in English, hardly anyone knows that. The Syrian opposition danced to the tune of their respective foreign funders, none of whom have any freedom, liberty or democracy in their own countries. Our first guest was a political exile from Iraq, persecuted by Saddam Hussein. But he was one of the leading voices against Britain and the US invading his country. It follows that he's no particular fan to the other half of the Ba'ath Party, which has reigned supreme in Syria for more than 40 years. But when it comes to a foreign-backed invasion of Syria, Sami Ramadani says thanks but no thanks. And Sami Ramadani joins us now. Thanks for joining us on the Sputnik, Sami. Uh, the talks, which weren't in Geneva, but are called Geneva too, how do you think they've gotten off? I think they got off to a very bad start because there was a serious attempt to sabotage it before even it starts with the publication of this report on the torture uh, claims and allegations uh, by the Syrian regime, uh, a report which was uh, funded by the Qatari regime. So immediately uh, uh, the Western media made it the top number one news item. It was to a tidal wave. It was number one item everywhere Absolutely. in the world. Absolutely. I hope I switched on the radio, 7 a.m., uh, BBC uh, 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 radio and television, uh, leading with it. And until midnight that day, they were leading with the same story. So obviously, it was a coordinated campaign to get it started on the wrong footing. Particularly, they because the United States itself I think, is not really sure whether they want peace in Syria. I think the, the question of escalating events in Syria is still on the cards as far as the United States, the Saudi regime, the Qatari regime are concerned, uh, the Israeli uh, regime. They, their intentions are uh, to sabotage Syria as a society, as a functioning state in the region, just like they did with Iraq. Uh, so there is a long-term agenda here, and the Geneva talks are but one stage in that, uh, in that process. Whether they really mean to have peace, I have my doubts myself. And the decision to exclude Iran, having previously invited Iran, was another major spoke in the wheel. Absolutely. Bec and it, it's, it, is, it is so illogical. Mm. If anybody wants peace in Syria, then Iran has to be involved. Uh, just like uh, the Saudis have to be involved because the Saudis have been funding various terrorist and armed groups in, uh, in Syria. And without uh, their uh, participation and acceptance of a peace project, uh, then obviously the, these talks will fail. And Iran is a strategic ally of Syria. And not to invite it is just totally irrational and also reveals certain bad intentions, especially in, the, in recent uh, weeks, uh, the Saudis the Saudi regime's role has become uh, quite, quite effective in terms of trying to stop any effort of a peaceful resolution to the Syria crisis. There were some protesters supporting Bashar al-Assad. Is that significant? I think uh, what is more significant is that within Syrian society, the more the armed opposition and that is important, the word mm. armed, because there is another opposition in Syria that the Western media tries to, uh, to gloss over. The, uh, the, uh, in, within Syrian society, the more the armed opposition showed its nature, its hand, if you like, and engaged in all sorts of uh, uh, terrorist activities, some torture activities, and so on, 
and also revealed its own political agenda of repressing women, rights of children, and so on, and minorities. And minorities. Up to 45% of Syrian society is composed of various types of yeah. ethnic and religious minorities. And these uh, groups have shown their hand. And Syrian society in general would say, we would rather have this state and this regime. No, thank you very much. We don't want that, uh, that horrid alternative. And that provides a social base which, is, which has kept this state and this regime uh, as, is, as is today. There is another type of opposition in yeah, Syria, a democratic. Yeah, opposition. Yeah, a democratic opposition which has been uh, on the scene for many decades now, demanding democratic mm. freedoms, demanding social justice, demanding greater rights, and so on. And this opposition has been totally, totally glossed over and ignored by the Western media because this opposition is patriotic. It wants uh, Syrian society and the Syrian state to function. They don't want to destroy it because they want to build democracy. They want to build something decent, in a, more decent at least in its place. And this opposition represents majority opinion in Syria. Mm. And it is this opposition which is totally, totally hostile to any type of intervention, uh, foreign-backed intervention in, 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 in Syria. Are they in Geneva, this part no, of the No, unfortunately not. Uh, this is one of the uh, handicaps, if you like, of Geneva. The United States, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf uh, states don't want any other opposition, but the armed opposition that they have been backing. Mm. And the terrorist organizations which they backed publicly earlier on, now they secretly back, in my opinion, still support these terrorist groups which are quite strong in, in, in Syria, and they are just as strong in Iraq today. The Syrian government is going to have to find some way of negotiating with decent, patriotic uh, people who want real change. Are they ready to do that? On paper they are, how serious they are is not quite clear yet. Because on the one hand, they have been negotiating with some of these organizations that I regard as democratic opposition in Syria. Some of these opposition groups are within the government. There's a coalition within the government. But the opposition I'm talking about, the democratic opposition, is outside the Syrian uh, government and, and regime. And they have a specific problem, program and specific demands. And it's these demands that the Syrian regime has to listen to, has to seriously negotiate with, if they want Syria to, uh, to be out of this uh, enormous crisis. Now, what is hindering this partly is the also Western uh, intervention, because Western intervention polarizes things in a military way, which makes uh, such negotiations with the democratic opposition almost meaningless sometimes because the gun is louder than these uh, peace, uh, peace groups which do represent large sectors if not the majority of Syrian opinion. All these interventions have in fact hindered democratic development in Syria. Militarization does not help peaceful democratic de development in any country. And the militarization of protests in Syria was the main reason why democratic evolution, democratic protest was uh, was hit so badly and it's the if you like those who participated directly the Saudi Qatari Gulf states which represent the most backward most brutal of well, societies. there's no democracy there's or freedom of any kind of any kind takes the Saudi state mm. I mean it's one of the most brutal on yes, planet earth towards, it is. towards the children towards women its social and economic program is is, is, is disastrous and they want to create something in Syria similar to their to their societies and most Syrian people are saying no thanks we don't want that we might not like our regime but yours is even more horrid indeed now what about the people who are at Geneva we are led to believe that the free Syrian army and the Syrian national coalition are one thing al-Qaeda affiliates uh, two of them in particular who are murdering each other in large numbers now are something different. Is that a real difference? Is the FSA and the Syrian National Coalition a reasonable, realistic partner for a negotiated peace on the part of the Syrian government? Can they find any elements within that coalition that might be the kind of people that they can do business with? In small numbers, yes, they can. But what is 
hindering this process is that the sponsors of these organizations are against reaching a, a truly peaceful resolution to the, to the conflict. And that is the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. These three states are still funding, arming, supporting these organizations. Unless these sponsors withdraw their support, then these organizations will remain in terms of their demands, escalating their demands or putting demands which are impossible to achieve because they sabotage any, to any possibility of, uh, of talks. So that is number one, that these sponsoring states have to change their tactics and strategy. If they don't, then we have a protracted uh, problem. The other problem is that the the open-ended type of support they give to all sorts of thousands of fighters that flooded Syria from the Arab world, especially from Libya, and from, uh, from Europe, from Chechnya, you name it, they poured in through Turkey, through Lebanese porters, through Jordan, some through, through Iraq. Uh, they poured into Syria, and, the, and Qatar alone, according to the Financial Times, spent $3 billion until two years ago. On, on the Syrian opposition, $3 billion. And this is a massive figure by any standards. So you, yeah, they have created a situation in Syria where these fighters flooded in. Some are there as mercenaries. They have got nothing to do with Syrian society or any allegiance to any religion, for, for that matter. And these are freelancers. Uh, they ha some of them have uh, declared allegiance to al-Qaeda and al-Zawahiri, who yesterday issued yet another statement calling for escalating the fight in Syria. Their offshoot in, in Iraq, uh, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, uh, uh, Daesh, they call them in, in Arabic for, for short, they are a, a, um, a formidable force now, both within Iraq and, and, and Syria. And their agenda sometimes meets Western agendas, sometimes it diverts, just like what happened with bin Laden in Afghanistan. They funded these terror organizations in an Afghan context uh, many years ago, and they became so strong, and they had enough finance to, to go it alone and to oppose occasionally Western interests. So you have a complex situation in Syria where you have uh, a democratic opposition, an armed opposition. The armed opposition has different factions within it, some truly terrorist, nasty organizations, other armed groups which are, again, funded and financed uh, from abroad. And it is these. If the sponsors of these stop, then the terrorist organization can also be isolated. On the ground, there is still, although there is occasional fighting between the armed groups, but on the ground, they do also cooperate. Frankenstein monster, indeed. Sami Ramadani, thanks for joining us on the